Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Shut Up and Do It podcast, the place where we bring you all things real estate and business with an advanced mindset and with, I've been doing this a hundred times, I still can't get it right. I got to read this damn thing. Hold on a second. <laughs> Welcome to the Shut Up and Do It podcast, a place you can come and hang out with us while we go through all things real estate and business and mindset, and we focus with guests who believe in a shut up and do it manner. I'm your host, Nick Allerud, host of the Shut Up and Do It podcast, creator of the coaching platform, REI Accelerated, and a principal buyer with AA Real Estate Group. We are buyers, fix and flippers, rental builders, team builders all over 10 different states, uh, and we are looking, always looking to build our teams, and if you have any deals for us, please don't hesitate to send them over to our way at, at deals at aarealestategroup.com. Um, we function as an educator and networker to help you in your businesses, to bring value to everyone who listens to this and who come to our events that are looking to scale their business or just get started. I'm so happy today to have a guest on today. His name is Katan Patel. Now this man, uh, this man is really cool. So the title of this podcast today, as you already saw, is starting with 8,000 in the bank, and reaching a multi-million dollar rental portfolio. But that is not all that this man has done. I'm going to let him tell some of his story, but um, he achieved an accelerated doctorate degree while learning English. Uh, he's a, a professional real estate mindset coach and strategist, and uh, he's also um, been, he tripled a senior housing, is it a senior housing facility? Or no, it's- uh, Senior care, more like home care without the facility, but senior of industry. Triple. So, okay. I'm going to let you talk about that too. Katan, thank you for being on the show today, man. Really appreciate it. Nick, thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm very excited for the conversation for today. Okay. Well, we're going to get to your struggle. We're going to get to the senior, the, the home care. We're going to get to all that. But right now I want to know $8,000. Tell me that story. How did that happen? Yeah. So, uh, you know, the very first time I've never bought a property or anything like that, I'm just working as a pharmacist and that day came and I had to pull the trigger and it was a $106,000 house. I needed 25,000 actually, which I didn't have. So I figured, let me get two pharmacist friends involved into this deal. And they were coming up with 8,000 each. And my problem became from 25 to eight. And at that time, so all the money I had saved as a pharmacist, I had already invested in another business venture that wasn't working out. It didn't work out. Uh, so I'm already starting from, you know, a uh, lower position, so to speak. And what I did was I opened up a 401k account and basically put all the money there and they were matching it. And I was able to take that loan out as that first $8,000. Ooh. Ooh, smart move. That's the first time we've heard that on this program. So you you put it your eight thousand, and then your two pharmacy friends put in their eight thousand, yep. and did all of that go into your four hundred one k to get the match? Uh, so no, they gave me eight eight. I put my four thousand into four hundred one k, which did a match. I don't remember the exact numbers, but I was able to take a certain amount out as that loan, and that's where I got that eight thousand. That's so cool. That was so for that was free money for you, essentially. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> very, very cool. So you and are these friends of yours too, or just colleagues, strictly colleagues? Uh, they, they are friends. We went to school, pharmacy school together. Okay. And it sounds like you're, you're always looking, you were always looking for an, an, another opportunity or another investment besides like counting and prescribing pills. Is that accurate? <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, you know, prescribing and pharmacy is a good profession. Like you do make a good amount of money for being a 25, 26 year old and all this, but ultimately I realized my value is innovation, creativity, freedom, entrepreneurship, risk-taking, that's who I am at core, which was not the job, right? Uh, so there was a huge mismatch. And at the end of the day, I had to solve that. That was one of my top struggle at that time. How do I get out of this, so to speak? That's awesome. That's it. How do I get out of this? So uh, we've been talking before the show and we've even met once before the show too. And we have an awful lot in common on mindset and we're going to get there. Um, you mentioned you had some struggles prior to being even in the pharmacy situation. And we're going to, I want to get back to your deal, but for right now, I, since you mentioned it, let's talk about what those were, what happened beforehand. 
Yeah, so you know, I moved to this country when I was 19. I wasn't I've read English back in India, but I've never spoke English. So speaking English, adjusting to another culture, working at liquor stores 40 plus hours and trying to get all A's so I could get into pharmacy school. That was like a lot to handle. Um, you know, everything just being thrown at you, so to speak. Uh, and then I didn't give myself option and I knew I want something. I just need to go for it. There's plenty of excuse. There's plenty of limitations to believe, or you just believe in possibility and you just, you just get things done. Right. So That's cool. So you were working at a liquor store 40 hours a week and trying to yep. you know, raise the money to go to pharmacy school uh, and getting and learning English at the same time. <laughs> That's pretty impressive. Right. Is that accurate? Yeah. Very cool. Okay. Yeah, so, so the English and whatnot. Yes, definitely. Very cool. Very cool. Okay. So you're, you're, you're now uh, in pharmacy school. You're out of there. You have two colleagues. You're looking to get into your first deal together. Tell us about that deal. If you remember it specifically. Yeah, specifically, it just the cash flow. It just made a lot of sense on paper that I could, you know, get 15, 17% of the invested capital. Uh, so it just made sense to go buy that deal. And I also knew intuitively that it's never about that deal, but you do a deal or you take a step forward. It's just like driving the car two miles forward. Now you're gonna see the bigger road out there, uh, which is the important piece. Uh, instead of just like, hey, this is making X percent return, blah, blah, blah. But then now we are missing all the growth opportunity that would lead from that transaction or business or deal or, or that networking event, right? That's it. That's it. So was it, lo was it local to the Boston area? Where was it? Yes. Yes. This was in the Worcester area. Worcester area. Okay. Was it a single or a triplex or? A uh, single. Single family. Okay. Yeah. So the three of you got together, put some money to together with a down payment. Yep. Uh, finance the rest, right? Did you, yep. and, and immediately, was it already rented or did you have to rent it out? So financing was a little snag where I was promised that, you know, three pharmacists income is way more than any ratio you could ever think of. Still, they denied the loan last minute uh, for, <laughs> for no reason at all. It's just a numbers game that they are playing. And, you know, I, I still made that transaction go through but actually it was very challenging. The first tenant, I hired a company to find the tenant, a rental company. They put a bad tenant. They didn't even do any of the work and the tenant stopped paying rent. They vandalized the property and you know we were in trouble right, right away. You know? Wow, learn, trial by fire though, right? Better yeah. to learn then, better yeah. to learn then. Crazy, we talk about a lot, um, the most dangerous real estate investors out there, I feel, are the ones who have done one deal and made a crap ton of money on one deal because now they have what we call home run syndrome, right? Like they're, they're, they can do no wrong and they're the smartest person in the room, right? So, so wait till the next one, right? And wait till when something happens, the market turns or a contractor is bad or a tenant is bad or whatever it is. But yeah. so it's good. You all three learned and you kind of banded together. And did you go through some challenges? Uh, did you end up terminating the management contract that you had, or did you continue with that manager and try to work through it? So their contract was only to get us the tenant. So they have already done whatever they were supposed to do. And then eventually I was able to get the tenant out, uh, rehab the place a little bit, rent it again and get it back on track. Gotcha. Brilliant. That was your first one. Yeah. That was your first one. All right. So from there, let's talk about how you got to the, the, the big portfolio. How did we do this? Yeah, after, after that, um, you know, my partners weren't necessarily interested in continuing more and more. It was a one deal thing, which is okay. But I knew that something is here that needs to be unfolded. So I started buying more uh, single family homes. I bought another two or three. And then eventually I learned the time and energy that goes in there. It's not worth it. I need to start scaling. Uh, so I started buying the three unit, five unit buildings. That's all. in the Worcester area. Uh, Worcester area, yeah, yes. Got it. Okay. And were you using uh, the cash out method, as we now call it? It's the Burr method now. That's the cool name. Was that your <laughs> using? A <laughs> little bit of that, a little bit of investor capital. I started raising money from friends and family. And on top of all that, I realized two things. One was I always wanted to get an MBA, but I figured, do I really go to BU and pay them 60 grand a year just to learn some theory? 
or do I buy a business I know nothing about and turn it around, which could be my MBA. So, and I also knew that passive income is going to take a while to build, right? It's not a year or two year process. So I ended up buying a, that senior care business and I was able to leverage that cash flow and that business and kind of pull that into real estate on top of bringing in investors and all that stuff. So, so cool. So, so cool. Now, raising capital is really one of your strong specialties, right? And there's a lot of people listening. Um, we've had a couple speakers on it, uh, but there's a lot of people listening that, right, there's a right way and a wrong way, right? And I want to talk about when you started, um, did you have any sort of stories in your head? Did you have any sort of things that were you hesitant to start asking friends and family? Like, how did that go with when you started to do it for the very first time? Absolutely. I have stories and I have found very, very few clients that are like, hey, I'm very comfortable. You want me to reach out to my friends and family? I'll call them tomorrow morning. <laughs> clients and people from all walks of life, real estate entrepreneurs, everybody has a struggle there. For me, I was thinking, hey, I'm going to appear salesy to them. Uh, what if this transaction doesn't work out? It's going to come in between the friendship. And, you know, I'm not going to feel good if something happens to this money. So all of this fear, all of this limiting beliefs and cutter just kept uh, flowing, so to speak, in, in the beginning phase. And I wasn't as aggressive or I didn't start it um, as much as I should have started. Hmm. Okay. So when you first pitched that first deal to your friends and family, um, how did that feel? And what were the reactions that you got? Yeah, so, you know, mixed reactions, right? Certain folks, it depends on, you know, how they look at business and life and everything. So some people weren't interested, uh, which will be the case all the time in your life. Some people would be somewhat interested and some people admired that I'm taking the initiative to even do this while I have a full-time job uh, as a pharmacist. And then I'm still, you know, helping family with some business matters and things like that. Uh, so, and all you need is an investor or two, right? Just to get things rolling. You don't necessarily need that million dollar check to scale everything in the beginning. That's amen to that. And I want people to hear that too, again. So, so Kitan took uh, an $8,000 investment, right? And partnered with two other people and got free money from his 401k to do it, to buy his first rental building that he had challenges with, but learned to overcome those challenges with the tenants and the vandalism and, he probably, I'm assuming, did you have a story in your head at that point too? Oh, well, this is for, you know, this tenant business is ridiculous and I knew this would mess up, or, but maybe you didn't. Maybe your partners did and you were getting the one trying to get them out of that. How did that work, this, those stories? Yeah, I mean, I felt a little bit like, wow, did this didn't go as according to plan. I didn't even knew to expect this, so it was that. But at the same time, I was like, I can't let something define me. If this one experience or event is defining me, that's not in alignment with the goals I want or who I want to become. There's a big mismatch. And if their mismatch is there, then I need to focus on the goals and who I want to become and not on this piece. And were you there the way you're speaking right now, right? That's where I wanted to get to in this conversation today. Were you there at that time? Did you already believe in this at that moment? Yes, I nice. wasn't clear on, on how it would happen or where it would go, but I was passionate and excited about creating wealth and taking this business to the next level. And I, I had a trust that, you know what? I'll figure it out. I yes. have a lot of things I didn't knew before. I figured it out. So how is this thing any different, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> we're on that topic, Katana. Now we, we go deep. You and I went deep at our lunch too. And I love that. Like, right? So we're in people who listen to this podcast, some people are into that, some people aren't. But it's funny because you talked about the how. And I still find myself struggling because I have a how. I know how this is going to work out. I've got my targets. I know exactly what I need to do to hit these targets. And then I don't get that target because something else changed in my life. The universe put something else in, in, in as an opportunity, right? But I might look at it as a distraction, but it's really an opportunity in my way to, to go after that. And then I'm really hard on myself because I had the how figured out and now the how's gone. Can you help me and anybody else who's into this understand that we should be surrendering to the how? How do we do that? <laughs> Absolutely, right? So what happens is the how we arrive, you, if you think about it, you have a certain amount of knowledge or information that you have accumulated or experiences you have. And from that, there's the neural map or connections made and you came with this how. Now compare that 
to the universal intelligence, God, spirit, cosmic consciousness, whatever you want to call. We can't even compare it. But what happens is when we feel that this how is something I could logically and rationally explain it to myself, it's like having the wheels on the uh, bicycle when, when a kid's learning, right? I have those I feel comfortable because this is my idea. I believe in it. I know. But when it comes the time to surrender, to go for something that's unknown, it's just like a trap door opens. You're falling 50 feet, maybe 1,000 feet. It's just that feeling, right, of not having a structure. No logic could explain it. And that takes a little bit of art and time to kind of understand that second way. It doesn't always have to be this way of hustle, try figuring out of ourselves. There's also that flow and intuition and science coming to you if you learn to navigate that piece. Oh man, I love this stuff. And I know that whoever needs to hear this is hearing it right now. Um, <laughs> that's the whole point. And even now at this point, right in our, in our professional careers, like some people will latch onto this and some people won't, and that's okay. That's okay. Tell, tell me more about your mindset and spiritual journey so you went through some coaches right yeah. um what prompted you to even reach out for that and then i'd love to hear some big takeaways from the people that you've seen yeah so just to simplify it i came up with this thing where you've heard of this right you work in the business then you work on the business e-myth and whatnot but i have not anyone talk about the next level which i figured out for myself is that it's working on yourself because when you work on yourself naturally you are going to work on your business better but not only that you're just going to be more successful you're going to feel good and when you have all that you might not even care as much about the goals um so for me i i hired the coach because i was trying to break into multifamily syndication and i'm like hey this seems a little challenging i don't know much about it maybe someone could support me but that led into me discovering more about my mindset and thoughts and events. And I saw that the playing field is so big out there, man. And here I am thinking about building some wealth and getting some properties, but I'm in one little corner and there's a whole oasis out there. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. And you, you've you been coaching with uh, Tony Robbins, right? Wim Hof. Tony Robbins, uh, coach Wim Hof and Dr. Joe Dispenza. Yeah. Indeed. What were some big takeaways, if you can think of any, from e any of those or all of them? Yeah. So, you know, with Wim Hof, the big, uh, big takeaway is that limitation. We don't even know the box we have created for ourselves. When I'm climbing the mountain with him, 20 Fahrenheit, uh, not wearing anything, just shorts, and there's steam coming off, I never thought that my body could go to that level our minds could go to that level, but typically, you know, we are in limitation. So that's something I learned from him. Dr. Joe Dispenza, I learned the power of the emotions and the spirit, but who has the time for that? We are just too 3D, too materialistic, so to speak, uh, which is good, right? Make money, enjoy, we are here to live the life, but don't forget there's also something else going on, uh, that other piece. And he's backing up that with neuroscience and data and things like that. I love that. And from Tony Robbins, I learned that ultimately, whatever we are doing, we are chasing feelings anyways. If, if I want to have X amount of wealth, that's because that will make me feel I'm important to myself or my family or in the culture, or they'll give me freedom. And you don't have to wait to be at that point. You could learn to feel all those feelings now, basically. Amen. I love it. So I want to share again with our listeners and our viewers right now. There's a reason that the people that we interview, right? Like Katan and I, uh, I'm not shameful about this at all, right? We're multimillionaires at this point. And there's a reason that once you get to this point or before you get to this point, we start really diving into the mindset. We dive into the, all the, the tougher questions. We dive into, are we limiting ourselves? And I, I love these deeper conversations. Uh, I'm going to shift it back to real estate, but I just want folks to know that there's a reason we talk about this. This We can give you all the mechanics in real estate. We can give you the mechanics of how to flip properties, how to wholesale, how to build a multi-million dollar portfolio, and how to raise you know tens of millions of dollars in private money. The challenge is you can't do it if you don't have this, right? Would you agree? Absolutely. You put it very well, that at the end of the day, 
2021, all the information's out there and you have done a phenomenal job creating these programs and all the information, but how do we apply? And we all are unique, our challenges are unique. So if we don't understand ourselves, then you know there's going to be that gap from knowledge to application. Amen, I love it. All right, let's head back into your syndication world. So you, you hired a coach, which led you into really exploring right our, ourselves and our spirituality and, every, and, and our mindsets. What um, the first syndication deal you did, I wanna hear about that. The, the pluses, but also the minuses. People love the screw ups too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, this was right around the time before I hired the coach a month or two or somewhere along those times, uh, I had to raise $500,000 for the first deal. And, you know, before I've been raising 50, 100 here and there, right? A small deal here, small deal there, but raising all of that money in 30, 45 days man, it, it could get challenging, especially when it's your first time and you have all these thoughts coming up. What if this, and, and you are doing it in another market, you know, with other partners. Uh, what if, you know, this market is not right? What if the timing is not right? Uh, what if the investors lose money? All of these things are coming across, but I had to choose in possibilities and just go go with that and you know at one point i was stuck at a certain number i wasn't getting to 500 and it was very very stressful um but i in hindsight i learned um, that it's okay even if you fail a raise or you lose money at property or something it's not end of the world we might feel like it that man that happened it's over my business is done which is never the case yeah amen okay so that deal were you able to do it? Did you raise the 500? Yes, eventually after that roadblock and getting little extension and all that, we were able to uh, cross that point. And then we were also able to sell that deal a uh, couple months ago, a full circle as well, you know, from raising to, to seeing like the end Yay! piece, so to speak. Yeah. All right, that means we have to go over the numbers. Let's do it. So purchase price, uh, CapEx, I want to know everything. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, don't, I don't remember the exact numbers on that but i know that the goal uh, the cap was somewhere around in high fives um okay. this is in dfw and it was a 240 unit the goal was the apartment you know value at rehab basically getting that nine percent cash flow eight to ten is the ballpark we were hitting nine nine and a half and then also getting a bump into the end uh so the asset was doing well but because of covid that sub market things were changing, but overall, we were able to hit 15, 16% on an annual basis, which is for a passive investment. Investors only cut the check. They've never done anything else. So uh, they, they were pretty happy. And, you know, we were able to do the exit and do a 1031 into another asset. Mm, very, very cool. And that 1031, so that was how many units? Uh, 240. 240. Yeah. And so you get, then you 1031 into another asset. Was it a higher class asset or was it more units or what was it? Yeah. So it's, it's more units, but also uh, with partnerships and syndications, the 1031s get very complicated. Uh, yes. So we had, you know, another deal that was sold and those investors and this deal, they, they all flow through. And then part of it, we bridge through a fund that we are raising for. Uh, so it's a little bit of hodgepodge, so to speak. I gotcha. To, to All that right. Transaction. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. But right now, how many units are you up to now, Katan? Uh, so I mostly focus on that equity piece uh, in the back end. And I've done over uh, 12, 14 transactions. These are all 250 unit plus where I'm bringing the investor capital, so to speak. So mm -hmm. up now, it's close to $12 million of equity raised. Brilliant. Brilliant. And you're, are you on those deals? Uh, yes. So yeah. I'm, I'm more on the capital raising side, but together for the group, it's over 7,000 units and over 1 billion in portfolio. Back in 2017, we were at 150 million. Uh, but this is just a bigger, bigger syndication group with roles and responsibilities. And it's been going uh, very, very well. So Brilliant. I love it. Very, very, very cool. Um, awesome. So uh, for those of you who don't know yet, I, I mean, Katana is known as a real estate strategist and coach, but he's also, as you just heard, uh, starting from his raising $24,000 for his first deal, he's now like an expert in capital raising. 
Um, Katan, tell me what what are the biggest challenges? If you can name the two or three of them, we yeah. might have chatted about them already. Biggest three challenges that investors have with raising capital. We'd love to hear it. Yeah. So the number one thing is not having a strategy around raising capital. Just making some calls is going to work. But if you don't have a strategy figured out, because all real estate entrepreneurs, your listeners, they all have unique business. They have different kind of personalities. They have different kind of skill sets. They have different interests. So they need to come up with the strategy that works for them and not for me or for you, right? Uh, this is a common mistake. The second thing is skipping that relationship building piece. Too many times real estate entrepreneurs are really, really focused on the deal. Hey, this is making 20% return, blah, blah, blah. But they don't take the time to really form that bond with the investor. Because until someone really, really trusts you, gets to know you, know why you're passionate about real estate, cutting a check is just you know uh, a far off thing. So it would be just building that connection, that story, understanding how to talk with them, call structure that, the strategy. And then the third piece would be mindset, um, the limiting beliefs around reaching friends and family, or um, you know, making 10 calls and nothing happened. And now it's just like, oh, maybe, you know, I, I don't know about this. And then also understanding that it's not about raising capital so I could make money, but it's about giving a potential opportunity to someone. I have investors that it's been four years and they are beyond happy. Um, and I told them, you work on first deal with me. It doesn't matter how much return it makes, but I'll guarantee you one thing. It'll be like my $106,000 house. After that, they started working with other people and buying their own deals and whatnot, but the whole door opened up. So understanding for the entrepreneur that it's not about raising capital, it's really impacting someone. And if it's a right fit, you do the deal. If not, no big deal. You're serving them. Just educate people powerfully. And then if they are the right folks, they'll come with you. If not, you are already getting rewarded for educating them. And then you move on instead of, hey, I didn't got the check, right? <laughs> brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. We all uh, capture permission, but uh, we, all have, we all have the people who resonate, right? People who resonate, people who don't, and both of them are totally okay. Yes, That's absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. I'm going to share, it's funny because I had a very limiting belief similar to yours where... Uh, we were looking at a portfolio that was going to require like um, uh, a, a $1.4 million raise, which for me was a lot of money, right? At the time, to the point where I'm like, I, I'm too scared of even doing that. I don't even want to do that anymore. And I called my commercial lender, right? The, the broker. And I said, listen, we have this deal on the table, but I'm scared. Like, I don't think I can raise this capital. And I just want to run it by you to see what you think, right? Because if the commercial lender gives them a blessing, then that's a good thing. And it's funny because he shattered my belief in one sentence. He said, and Nick, you know, your purchase price is over 5 million. You, you get over 5 million and the whole world opens up for like bigger and deeper capital sources. Like that's easy. And I'm sitting here like banging my head against the wall, trying to raise like 700, 800 K on these deals. And all of a sudden I just had to go up more and it becomes easier. <laughs> you know what I mean? It yeah. was like, it blew my mind on that side. And then I just, I never realized that, you know, money is not real, right? Money is just, it, it, it flows in and it comes out. It's liquidity. It keeps economies going, but it's like, there's just so much of it. <laughs> and, and, and you start to learn, like when you get out of that scarcity mentality of like, wow, 700,000 is a lot, 530,000 is a lot of money. 500,000 is a lot of money. 1 million is a lot of money, right? Now it's like 10 million or 50 million or hundred million is a lot of money. It's all the same. It's just a matter of how we're looking at it, right? And who we bring to the table to raise our own game. Would you agree? Absolutely. It's just a concept at the end of the day, right? We were trading slippers for loaves of bread and eventually we came up this thing, right? So the, your beliefs about money are really, really important. So if you think that a million dollars is a lot of money, it's a crazy number, then you are going to not take the action. But if you think, hey, million dollars is 10 investors at 100,000 apiece, let me find 100 folks. And I'm pretty confident that one out of 10 would invest the whole problem solved, right? Or, or in your case, you're like, let me talk to my lender. Just thinking about what is that next little step you could take, which is a possibility. It doesn't have to work. But even doing that, you're training yourself to, you know, believing in something else instead of just like, hey, this seems like a lot of money. And sometimes that stretching is good. 
Um, because sometimes when it stretches, we are, you're making that leap of faith. Okay, I'm just going for it. Even if it doesn't work, you will realize two things. First is it's not bad. It's not end of the world. You experience it. And second, you'll always learn something so you could immediately fix it in the next month or two or six, right? Uh, so it's all win-win situation, even if it works or doesn't. I love that. I love that. What projects are you excited about right now, Katan? Right now, so, you know, venturing a little bit outside of real estate as well uh, and, you know, doing my own uh, cannabis investing and food startup investing and whatnot. But uh, I'm very excited about the capital raising mastermind that I created last year, just adding more and more things to it. Um, so the entrepreneurs could see that, you know, we don't have to believe in these limitations. There are so many tools and things you could use just to actually get out there. And if you have good deals, and if you are very good with particular strategy, rehab, condo conversion, whatever, why not do a little more of it, support other people, and then you could build wealth along the lines as well. That's so brilliant. So that's a that's a group that you're, it's a mentorship that you're offering, right? Yes, yes. Okay, got it. How would they uh, get more information on that? Yeah, so for anyone that's interested, they could go on my website, Katen Patel, that's K-E-T-A-N-P-A-T-E-L.com. Click on the take action button, fill the form. Absolutely, they need to mention you, Nick, or Shut Up and Do It podcast, because I do have a special pricing for them if it's a good fit. Um, if they're your tribe, I want to make sure I take care of them. Very kind of you. And I, so I've been, have I been saying your name wrong for about two months? Say your name again. <laughs> So, okay, it's Ketan, but a lot of people call it Ketan, Ketan, but that's okay. And well, KP is easy. You've been going with KP, so that, that works, yeah. Might as well fix it being live on the air, right? Might as well. So that's all right. Um, no, Ketan, you said. Was that you said? Yes, Ketan, yep. All right, Ketan, Ketan Patel. Uh, folks, I don't know if you heard uh, Ketan Patel. He is offering uh, discounts and incentives. If you go to his website, right, at Ketan Patel, there it is again, <laughs> katenpatel.com, K-E-T-A-N-P-A-T-E-L.com. And you click on the take action button. Make sure you put in S-U-D-I in the how heard. That's shut up and do it, S-U-D-I. And you're going to be getting uh, a, a special discount as well as some extra incentives there. We really appreciate that, uh, Kate. And thank you very, very much for offering that to our listeners. Uh, I think it's a huge, huge benefit for people. A, a, for those of you, again, listening, like, just listening to this conversation that that he and I are having, right? Like there is so much more here with limiting and crushing beliefs and mindset than you're going to get with just mechanics of raising money for a deal. And if you can master the mindset at that point, 10 million is not a lot of money either. And you learn the five pillars, right? Of raising capital. Yeah. And, and the biggest one is just to get out of your own way. And he can, he can help you out through that. So very, very, uh, I, I resonate with that completely. Thank you so much for offering that and what you're doing. So, <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity. Very, very cool. Um, all right, I'm going to ask you one quick question before we start to wrap up. I love this question. I ask a lot of people this question, and I did steal it completely from Tim Ferriss. What is your favorite purchase in the last year that's under a hundred dollars? My favorite purchase under a hundred dollars. It will have to be a book. <laughs> I guess you can cop out. What's your favorite book that you've gifted or given someone in the past year? Go ahead. It would be Psycho Cybernetics. Ooh, new one. All right, talk about it. What's that? What's this one? So the name kind of scares people or a little, it's a little off, but basically this is a book from 60s by a plastic surgeon. And this is the fundamental book where a lot of the things in the self-development or change world that people are referring to today, whether it's gratitude or limiting beliefs, uh, this guy had figured all that out. So even Tony Robbins, a lot of his program and his information he has based from this book. It's a little hidden gem, so to speak. Gotcha. That's brilliant. Cool stuff. Uh, Ket, now, now I'm just going to screw up your name every time. Ket, Ketan. No. Ketan, yeah. <laughs> Ketan. Yeah. Ketan, um, I really, really appreciate your time today, man. This is, this is huge. Any, any last bit of advice you want to provide? to any sort of either fledgling or intermediate or even advanced, we have some syndicators on the show too. Anything you want to provide to them? Yeah, I would say, you know, it's a, it's a two-step process to growth. Step one is always cultivate the awareness. What do I need in this moment? 
And from a grand scale, it's always strategy, mindset, or execution. Maybe you have a great strategy, great mindset, you're not executing best, or you are executing good, you don't have that mindset, or maybe you have that you don't have. So that will immediately clarify, okay, you know what, what do I need to work on? And then you work on that. Now you're at the next level. And then you deepen the awareness again, because as you grow, we know that challenges are going to come. Decisions have to be made. So this is a very simple, easy framework to ask yourself, what do I need here? Strategy, mindset, or shut up, just execute, right? <laughs> <laughs> there it is. I always can fit the name of the show in every episode. I love it. Thank you so, so much. Uh, hey, folks, that was it for this episode. We wanted to thank you for taking part and enjoying the show here today, whether you're on uh, you know, Google Podcasts or you're on the, 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 the internets and the iPodcasts and all of that stuff. Uh, we really appreciate it. And we're also on the YouTube channel. Um, they, so this is called the Shut Up and Do It Real Estate Podcast. We bring as much value as we can by offering you top quality guests and speakers. Today, we had Katen Patel. Katen. You Say got it. Again. it. All you right, got I got it. it. Yeah. I got it. All right, we had uh, Katen Patel uh, joining us. To, so he, we, we, we lured you in because he absolutely did build a multi-million dollar real estate portfolio by using $8,000. But the bigger part of this is all about up here. And I love that we went deep in this episode. I love every one of these. It's, it's a big connection. So Katen, thank you for your time today, man. Really appreciate you having you. Thank you so much. And wish everyone, all of your listeners, continued success and fulfillment. That is awesome. Folks, make sure you hit the like and subscribe buttons below. Please hit the uh, uh, the share buttons. Do all that stuff. It really helps us out big time uh, as far as, you know, activity and rankings. Uh, and if you're new to the, if you're in the Boston market or New Hampshire markets, please make sure you check us out at the uh, newly formed networking groups called REI Unleashed. It meets the third Tuesday of every single month. We'd love to see you there. It's an intermediate and beginners. It alternates between the months. Uh, you can check that out at reiunleashed.com. And until next time, thanks so much for listening. And remember to shut up and do it.